afternoon all of you. Uh, I come from Patanjali and in Patanjali we uh, greet everyone it's connected by saying Om. So Om to all of you from uh, our heart to your heart and I'm very happy to be here at Naipur. This is the first time I'm here and as I was driving into the campus in the morning, I was very happy to see the greenery all across it and I'm further happy to see the greenery on the faces of each all of the audience that who are looking for a science ahead and trying to get things done, how things should be done. So thank you very much, Naipur, for calling me here. It's my privilege to be here. And, I, and we have uh, so many good scientists sitting here. Uh, Ma'am, thank you for the introduction, sir. Thank you for, for calling me here. And all of the people on in audience, thank you very much for being here. Just uh, next 10, 10 to 15 minutes, I'll try to explain the type of science we are doing it and try to give you some data. And then, as ma'am said, that we are very strict with time, and I'll try to follow the orders, ma'am. So can have my slides? No. Is it visible there? No? Sure, sir. So uh, while we are setting up the slide, I would like to say that, that uh, Patanjali Research Institute is a rather uh, new institute. I believe that we are in infancy. That means uh, it's just four and a half year old institution, and it takes uh, several years for uh, institute to develop its flavor and try to get things how the center would be doing it. So since there are, is it visible to all of you? Only I'm seeing it in fragments. Good. So uh, today I'm going to explain to you regarding the pharmacological and toxicological assessment of ashwagandha and how that is relevant in terms of drug discovery for uh, new drugs. Before that, I will try to also give you flavor for the introduction of Patanjali Research Institute because most of you may not be knowing about it and I think that's an opportunity to talk about it, where I work and what we do. So this center was inaugurated in 2017 by our, our Prime Minister Modi ji and uh, these labs are probably one of the only kind which have been set up to bridge the gap between the modern practice and our ancient knowledge Ayurveda. Top of the line equipments, best of the brains and the ideas work together to deliver what we are looking for. And we strongly believe that these literally state of the art facility are one of the only kind uh, in India or across the world for doing a research in Ayurveda and yoga. So the mission of the institute is to actually improve the health and the quality of life through research and innovation. And how do we do it? That's our vision right there. That we take the unstructured Ayurvedic herbal information, take the rich history of Indian medicinal plant and all the stuff that we have in our ancient books, funnel through the various process of wisdom, practice, delivery, multi-pronged uh, approach, and trying to deliver something called scientifically validated evidence-based medicine systems and try to get something which would be like what you see in the next slide, which we are aiming for. So we have four stages of the uh, whole segment. We go for initiation, transition, actualization, and excellence. So the excellence is the ultimate goal, and we are looking for universal acceptance of Ayurveda, how I Ayurveda can be accepted beyond the national boundaries of India. Right now, we are at the stage of actualization where we have energized workforce, we have ignited thoughts, and we are focusing on the quality delivery. Now, when we talk about research institution, generally you look for the different degrees of strength and accreditations. That way, Patanjali Research Institute per se has a very diversified research framework. So we have labs which are accredited with NABL, we have DSR accreditations, close to 300 scientists work here, several PhDs and postdocs with global experiences. We have full-fledged animal house with the uh, CPC compliance. Our labs are biosafety level two labs. We have a dedicated corridors for doing the type of work we do. We have ethical committees for doing clinical trials. We have a 250 bed hospital attached to the institute. And uh, we have Ayurvedic Medical College with the PGs in eight subjects that happen. On the top, Patanjali has 1,500 medical doctors on roster across India and the daily footfall of 15,000 patients that happens. And we compile, acquire all the data of these patients in a very tight fashion. So far, the data that we have is close to one crore patients which have been collected for last so many uh, years. 
Now, what we do at Patanjali? So, Patanjali comes in the picture in terms of Patanjali Research Foundation Trust, which has a five major segments. The segment for drug discovery of development, there is the segment for herbal research where we do the compilation of ancient science in form of World Herbal Encyclopedia, which is the largest collection of all the information across the world and is coming out in 108 volumes. That work has been there for last four to five years. We have a classical uh, collection of paintings and herbarium. We have ancient documented uh, compiled in, I think we have close to 100, 120,000 sheets of the ancient documents which have been now digitized and compiled for harvesting new information. And on the top we have yoga research where we do the research on yoga and it, it, its uh, practices. Other than that we have other uh, components from our sister companies in Patanjali where we get all kind of help. Now what we do? So drug discovery and development where I come from, where I lead that function, it has five major departments, in vitro biology, in vivo biology, herbal chemistry, microbiology, and clinical research. And there is a glimpse of a little bit of our laboratories that you see on the screen on the right hand side. Now, what kind of research we do? So we do a fo focus research on various hu human diseases. Uh, as you can see, the therapeutic area, inflammation, metabolic disorders, cancer, neuroscience, and infectious diseases, and the number that you see next to them are the number of test articles we have worked with. Simple means number of drugs that we have developed and worked, and some of them have been already released in the market. And uh, you see some of the photographs of those uh, medication that has come out from the research work put done at PRI. You could see coronil there, which was there, again, the hero of the story for quite a while during uh, the COVID times. Now, here comes the theme that uh, what is there for traditional medicine and what is there for phytopharmaceutical drugs. So traditional medicine, most of us know very well that you take the information from our classical text. You actually use those crude extracts or uh, get things as they are described in the classics. So you don't have purified or standardized fractions in journal. People now do it, but largely it is done that way. And it may contain metal, it may contain mineral in, in form of various basmas, and they are actually exclusively done as they are described in the text, and also the uh, Drug and Cosmetic Acts also approve them as such. And largely they are exempted from detailed in vivo studies and also from clinical trials. But what we are looking for, if you had to take the Indian drugs or the Ayurveda beyond boundaries of India, you would have to go towards uh, the rules what are set up by other people, and those are phyto pharmaceutical drugs. So there, the, the, there are basic four or five major parameters. The one which I find very critical, and I think uh, students there in the audience should also pick this up, that <clears throat> each herb, single herb, should be characterized by four major bioactive compounds, which could be seen in each and every sample of that drug collected at any amount of time from any part of India or across. So that becomes a key point. That if we can characterize a drug or a single herb in such a way that you can find out what are the components. And if you can define those components and their quantity in a given sample, then one could move ahead towards the right direction. Other than that, there has to be purification, there has to be standardization, and it has to be there for the human use, for internal or external, but without going towards injectables. So largely, oral delivery comes through the uh, same ways and one need to generate a strong body of evidence by doing clinical trials. So Patanjali is working in the same direction. And now uh, what are the real approaches for the same? That you generate a totality of the evidence, that you get a very well controlled botanical raw material. You have uh, data done from uh, MADs and SADs in the clinical settings. And you have a robust chemistry, manufacturing and quality control process and have clinically relevant bioassay in, in vitro biology labs. And that becomes a roadmap where have, we have been working for last three years or so. And the process for that is fairly simple. Most of you would be having in your textbook, but so I will not go very much detail on these slides and let you read it if you can read that fast, because ma'am said that after 22 minutes, she's going to sh shut down the mic and I have to speak. So I have to go through very quickly on that. So the, ro the critical component that we believe, which is there for uh, phyto 
pharmaceutical route is to actually trace the drug that we're going to work with. If it's coming from natural source, the traceability becomes a bigger concern because these are growing in wild or it has been dealt and handled by several people who are not really familiar with the science of Ayurveda. So what really happens is that one has to set up the route. And the idea there is that we have a, a very well-defined morphological features, microscopic observations of the sample, DNA barcoding. So we do that very often now. Most of the samples that we de deal with have been barcoded by looking at a specific DNA of that given hub and then have a specific chemical markers and put together and all four of them are called quality markers. And from there, we go towards traceability. That is there in the claim that we talk about a product. And of course, you also look for the uh, transitivity in the chain. And finally, you have a QC done for a raw material to the whole product. So you starting from the sourcing till the time you are making the tablets and they are reaching to the market or to the patient. Now, so much is theory. What I'm going to talk about, I need to talk some, some data. So what I'm going to talk today is about ashwagandha. And most of you who know uh, about ashwagandha, that's one of the very well sought after herbal plant, uh, not only in Indian system, but there in the Chinese, Tibetan, and also some part of, of Egypt. They also use the ashwagandha as a herbal drug. And uh, most of the time when you read about ashwagandha, it's the roots of ashwagandha which have been described classically to have a lot of medicinal value. And now uh, that the big point that comes, and that's where Patanjali comes in the picture, is this that we look for the classical medicinal texts which are written several hundred years before. And for last 200 years or so, there is not a new, not a single, or maybe a few new drugs that came in the picture from the modern science or from the new practice of herbal research. In simple words, for last 200 years, we have not discovered new medicines from the natural sources. And I work for a part of drug discovery. So the point there is, can we look for a, some component of a known medicinal plant and try to find if there is some medicinal property in the other part as well. For example, in ashwagandha, roots are very well defined. But what happened to the flower? What happened to the whole, whole plant, the leaves, the seeds? And that's where we start working for it and try to find out, yes, there is some medicinal property which come from these kind of uh, other plant part as well. And that's the reason my title was going away from the roots that we are trying to okay, not going away from the Ayurvedic roots, but it's going away from Ashwagandha roots just to find out new drugs which might have a medicinal value. So uh, when we talk about new drugs, uh, new formulations, the first question comes, are they safe? So for that, we did uh, our 28-day talks study first in the whole plant extract of Ashwagandha that doesn't have the root. So like the almost the whole plant minus the root. And we made the extract out of that and did a tox study and could find that, that this drug or this extract is actually safe up to 1,000 milligram per kg per day, which is a really large dose for that kind of drug, which we, of course, published in scientific reports a couple of months before. And the data looks pretty much same, that the change in the body weights and the food consumption didn't change. Histopathologically, we look for all relevant um, tissues from the animals, male, female, both, and we could not find any cross pathological or histopathological change. So the drug was considered safe and we could actually move ahead on that. Now, the thing that I'm going to talk today, and ma'am, if you allow me to have like uh, maybe 10 minutes from now, that I will show you some data and I'll go very fast and all the students in the audience, if they think they miss something, please feel free to ask after the meeting or during the meeting, I'll be very happy to explain to you. So we now move, that, move towards the seeds. So ashwagandha seeds are not described anywhere in Ayurvedic texts that they might have a medicinal value. And that's where we start looking into it. We took something called uh, supercritical fluid extraction. That means you take CO2, give it in high pressure, convert that into a liquid, and take the powder of these seeds and put in that liquid, let it get extracted all the fatty acid components in it, remove the pressure, and the oily component will come out of it. That's the most green technology possible to isolate the fatty acids or the fatty acid containing material from any plant source. And we tried doing that for the ashwagandha. So we did that and we, go, uh, we got that and we called that uh, Vidania Somnifera Seed Oil, WSSO. And we did some validation for looking for anti-sobriatic effect because the chemistry suggests that way. And we also measured in a, uh, doing a lot of microbiology where the team does it fantastically. We also worked on the whole plant extract, the, the tox data I showed to you, 
and that is the actually extract which were the center stool for looking for coronal during the COVID time. And we could find that the one component from that extract was very critical to inhibit the interaction of the SARS-CoV-2 virus with host proteins. So quickly, let's go through the data. This is what you see for supercritical fluid extraction. This is the machine that we have it here, and we could actually get that oil form very quickly. Close to 16% oil was found from these seeds. So this is uh, uh, GCMS data, GCFI data actually, where we could find the total amount of fatty acid present there, and we found all of those good fatty acid. And ma'am, these fatty acids are pretty much of the same type what we see in the Sivakthon oil, where where it shows that it might work for psoriasis. So we took it from there and did a lot of uh, characterizations in terms of further chemistry and also lo uh, looking for biological response. And this is the data that was uh, done by in, in vitro biology lab where we could see that the application of this oil could actually uh, control the secretions of various cytokines, TNF-alpha, IL-6, and also modify NF-kappa B. And, uh, in the human skin cells, we could also see that if we have uh, induction of these cytokines by uh, inducing by LPS or by TPA, both are the uh, uh, disease-causing agent, could, uh, could actually also get modified by WSSO. Now, we did some experiment with animals, and uh, with the in vivo biology team jumped in, we could actually generate in vivo models of psoriasis by application of TPA, and we could find that, yes, indeed, uh, these oil uh, samples, when we apply topically or fed orally, could also control the progression of psoriatic-like inflammation, and which was comparable to dexamethasone turn in parallel. And these are histopathological data that also claims that the type of uh, skin changes that you expect to see, it does happen from the same oil, which was again published in biomolecules in, I think, 2021 or so. Now, the same oil can be looked for the activity against uh, different kind of bacteria. So we looked for Salmonella entrica, and there we could see, yes, indeed, it does uh, inhibit the growth of bacteria. It also affected the mortality of bacteria and could also affect the cell wall integrity of the bacteria, which get di disrupted in a dose-dependent manner. Later, we went ahead to look for the biofilm activity, and we found that when we generated the biofilm, this oil can actually decrease that biofilm, and it also affect the maturation of the same biofilm. So we did the th a three experiment where we look for the formation, we look for the prevention, and we also look for eradication. In all three conditions, we could see a dose-dependent response coming from the same oil, which we published later in Phytomedicine Plus. Now, looking for the whole plant. So whole plant extract, the tox data that I talked about you earlier, we now look for how we can use it for the COVID time. So for COVID, most of you now know it is almost like a textbook knowledge that the SARS-CoV-2 virus interact with the host protein by uh, spike protein and ACE2 interaction. So the team uh, from uh, computational department, they actually did a lot of uh, docking and uh, simulation experiment and found this compound called Bidinon that you see green color red right in the center, which actually affects the interaction of these two proteins. Bidinon come from ashwagandha, so we purified that component, we make an enriched extract coming from the whole leaves and could do a basic biochemistry and could show that in a dose-dependent manner, the physical interaction of these protein can be in in inhibited by Bidinon. So what happened next? If you can get it, can you purify into a label that can be uh, tested for the animal experimentation? And that time we did this experiment it's like 2020 where it was very hard to get the reagent because this is all lockdown going on. Our, our lab was fully functional. We did not take the lockdown at, at that time. But what we could find that can we generate some model which would be useful. So uh, first we purified the HPLC graph that shows there that we could get an enriched extract from ashwagandha where we could find that yes, within one was present right there and we have an extract that can be tested further. But the challenge happens that where would we test it? Because somehow this virus, COVID virus, doesn't affect uh, uh, mice and rats, which is the normal model. So we had to set up a new model and we did that on the zebra fish. But zebra fish has no lungs and lungs was the uh, primary target organ. So how do we do there? And again, uh, can we do some experiment which is relevant to human? So there were a lot of challenges. And in this slide, I'm just trying to show the type of challenges we faced and the type of solution we found. So zebrafish has something called a swim bladder, which is the air pocket inside the fish, which is 
are used by fish for going up and down in the water. So we thought, okay, that might become an ortholog of a human lung because that's also air sac. But now can we take human lung cells, a 549 cells, and transplant them inside that air sac? So we tried doing that and we did that actually. So we, we got the human lung cells, put it inside the swim bladder and get them home in. And in, in this slide, if you can see, within 15 days, these cells actually found a new home. They start to grow inside that uh, air sac. And once they start to grow, so now we have a sort of xenotransplanted humanized fish which can be taken further. These humanized fish were later injected with the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein to generate a uh, physiology or pathophysiology of the SARS-CoV-2 in these models. So that was done and we injected that and we look for the various parameters which are relevant for the disease. One of the parameters was fever that happens in the uh, SARS-CoV-2 in the clinical setting. Then again, next question come, how do you measure fever in a fish? Fish is a cold-blooded animal. It will change the temperature as per the things happen. So there again, the new device was formed where we put them in, into different temperature boxes which are interconnected and we cap the temperature of those boxes at different level and let the fish move from one box to another that you see right over there. And then we see the total amount of time spent by fish at a given temperature. That would indicate the choice of temperature of that animal. So basically that become a behavioral fever. And that's how we can quantify that once the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein was present in those fish, those fish actually choose to spend more time at a higher temperature. They spend more time at 37 degrees Celsius. And when they were given within on or the extract from ashwagandha whole plant, they came back towards the normal temperature. That means they were showing a recovery. So that recovery happened and that we could show it beautifully. Yes, indeed, uh, the uh, extract from ashwagandha whole plant has an effect to modulate, modulate SARS-CoV-2 pathophysiology, which we published uh, later in Drug Design, Development and Therapy and that uh, came out and, and the coronal happened at the same time. We tried to find out the different component of coronal would have a similar kind of physiology. Now, this is the almost last part. They're looking for a whole plant extract for another disease, which is a microbiological phenotype, looking for entry uh, uh, trichic uh, effect, where we try to find out if we look for this skin disease, which has a critical component for human uh, functionality, can that be modified? And we found, yes, indeed, it did happen. We could find that uh, this extract destabilized the peripheral integrity. And this means one minute or two minutes? Five. 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 That's good. Then. So this, again, we published later in PLOS, neglected and topical diseases. All, all of these data that I'm talking to, to you today, I'm going really fast just to uh, ignite some interest in you. Those of you who are interested can go to Patanjali website, all of this data there in form of publication and also some raw data. So go through it and try to find what we can do and how those are possible. Sir, thank you very much for five minutes, I'm just done. So these are the summary that uh, what are the considerations for setting up uh, botanical ingredients in formulated in the different product. The biggest challenge is to looking for the markers, barcoding, and also looking for different kind of uh, chemical components present in each batch of the drug that we are working with. And uh, robustness of that ancient science comes in the picture when we started to show some data behind the logic and the science our ancient folks has done it. The way forward that we are looking for, what we are looking for to set up a, a phytopharmaceutical route for most of the herbs that we have been working with. Ashwagandha example, you have seen it now. We are working with Big Giloy, we are working with Kalmig, and we are working with several other herbs. Hopefully soon you would be seeing them coming out, coming out in form of a drug where the physician can also write those for a prescription. So with this, thank you very much. You have been a good audience and ma'am, thank you for the uh, time that we have with you. So any query that you have, please ask. So thank you, Dr. Vashne, for an excellent and very absorbing presentation. There are few questions, two, three questions we can take from the audience. Ah. Sir, my, my, my time is now not covered yet. Yeah. Oh, five minutes. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. So nice of you. Yes, Dr. Vashne, very good presentation. 
So my question is like you are mostly working with the name Sovnifera. So are you planning to develop it as a phytopharmaceutical drug? Yes, sir. So in that direction, you did this 28 days repeat dose toxicity. So what was the rationale for selection of these three doses? Because directly you cannot select three doses like uh, before, without doing the acute oral toxicity, dose range, range finding study. Without that, we cannot select. Uh, we did all of that. It's just that I have to speak in 25 minutes, so I only show the data that matters. Because, Those yeah. study was also done. We published the subacute tox study, and we found that uh, the drug was safe up to 1,000 uh, mg per kg per day. The uh, uh, acute tox that it talked about, it was safe, safe up to 2,000 mg. Uh, mg per kg per day. And in repeat dose toxicity, this 20, what is the, what was the NOL value? Because that is NOL one, value. 1000 milligram per kg. Because that is too high. Based upon that, you have to select the human dose. That's correct too. So we are saying that you have a large play field. It now depends what is the pharmacological dose that you get. So the uh, therapeutic advantage that we see, the ratio from your pharmacological dose and the toxicological dose. So your drug is safe, which you expect to be safe, up to that high dose. But the pharmacological relevant dose will come somewhere around 10 to 50 milligram per kg per day. So another question is like uh, you're planning to develop as a phytopharmaceutical. So I could not see the four markers data here, quantification data for four markers. Uh, four marker data is there as well. Uh, this is, okay, I'll just show it to you here that I have those backups here. So you can see these are the markers that we have been working. Yeah, so quantification. So that All of those have been quantified, looked for 50 different batches come from the 10 different geography across the India. We have time for quick one or two questions from students. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Very good afternoon, ma'am. And thank you for uh, this uh, to tell us about uh, everything. Too fast, right? <laughs> Sir, you have to ask that you have taken phytochemical and all the drugs. So, what is the thinking for any uh, use of any other drug to be a neurodegenerate to protect the neurodegeneration? Neurodegeneration. Uh, for neurodegeneration, uh, we are not looking at ashwagandha. We are not looking at bidania. We are looking for other things. And the choice of drug for that is malkangani and also uh, this one that we now are getting a very good data. It's called Calmake. So the, uh, in the bigger problem with the neurodegeneration um, field is crossing the blood-brain barrier. Hmm. So See. most of the drug will show a good response in vitro, but when we go in vivo, the response becomes slow. So we have to add some enhancers. And we have found that the extracts coming from Kali Mirch and Peepli, which has a, a compound called piperin, helps him to get the drugs across the blood-brain barrier. So the bioavailability of those extracts in the brain tissue gets higher when we do those experiments. So we are working in those direction. Maybe some other time we talk about. Okay, because to transport to BBB, we use nanoparticles, no? To Nanoparticle start with some other regulation component, and phytopharmaceutical does not cover those. So uh, we are now talking about just pure unmodified herbs. Just you can purify them or enrich them in form of a cluster, but not changing their structure or the packing as nature has done it. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, please. Nice presentation. Sure. Right. I like that. Thank you. So, if you see that there are three chambers 23, 29, and 37. On both sides, there is a cooler chamber, then is a warmer chamber. And the hole in those chambers are smaller, where fish can't swim, but water can go. So fish is only allowed to move between these three chambers. And one side you are keeping a cooler temperature, one side keeping warmer. And there is a, a gradient. So the flow of this solution will maintain that temperature. And you have thermometers in all five of those, which are being recorded continuously. So once you set that up for like one day stability, then you take your pet fish and drop them there. So the maintenance is done by maintaining the temperature and the uh, flow of water. These were adjusted in order to maintain 23, 29, and 37. This actually, the warmer one was actually went up to 45 or so. So it, it like uh, 21 or uh, 
22. So these were actually, uh, both of them, have, this guy has a heater and this one has a piezoelectric device to cool it. So you calibrate both until the three chambers has a temperature of your choice. So it is more of trial and error but maintaining it sustainably so that the fish would not go for a temperature shock. And you always introduce them in the center chamber and let them go wherever they want to. And then there's a camera on the top which is recording their movement for a three minute window. So these are freshwater fish. Sir, please. Exactly. We already started, sir. That's a good point there, and we started. We are actually uh, the the mouse. Well, we are not doing that study at Patanjali. We are doing. We have outsources to China. China does it very often. So they have uh, genetically modified mice, which has a H2 knocked in, and those animals are actually sensitive to SARS-CoV-2. So at the time when we got a new strain in India, that time we looked for it and, and tried to find whether that strain can cause the changes right there. And we did some experiment, coronal showed a good success there too. We found that the total uh, virus titer in the animals was decreased by coronal, which is the drug which contains some part of ashwagandha. And we also found that the, the cardiac sign of infection was reduced in a dose-dependent manner. So we did find there is a pharmacological effect of the test article. Thrombosis was not measured there. I think the animals, it, it becomes difficult to measure thrombosis, especially in this model. And again, it's a very acute model seven days old. Th thrombosis will take slightly longer duration or higher severity of infection. I don't think this model was that robust. Of course. We will, we will go for the uh, bigger one with you, sir, for sure. Thank you. Uh, thank sir, you, Dr. Varshna. I think, question. yeah, I think uh, we have running, we are running short of time. After the session, during tea time, you can interact with him. I hope uh, you are still there after Sir. five. So please take questions during that time. So I can take Thank you, Dr. Vashne, for thank your you. nice presentation. Thank you. Give him a big applause. Yeah. Yeah, man. So, oh, man. Moment. Okay, that's good. Good afternoon to all. So I think uh, uh, Dr. Sandeep, he is known to everyone here, but still, uh, he is our own alumni from uh, Naipur Mohali, completed his PhD in 2007 from our department and then moved on to do the postdoctoral research in USA, then worked in industry, Piramal Research Center, and after that he joined Triple IM Jammu, started his career, and uh, he has uh, done uh, excellent work, published extensively and even developed two phytopharmaceutical, nutraceutical products. One from, I guess, uh, Crocus sativus that we all know, saffron, and then the another one from Roy Tukin. So he had uh, done, I mean, that is what he's going to talk today. So with this uh, introduction, I invite uh, Dr. Sandeep to present uh, his lecture. Better to speak from here so I can see my slides. So 
very good afternoon to all. So, so I always feel uh, coming to Naipur Mohali because I feel as a second home for me. So I always uh, consider this as an opportunity to uh, speak in front of the audience. So uh, can you load my presentation, please? So OK, OK. So uh, before my slides are loading, so I'll, uh, it is always uh, like Dr. Vashne has already talked much, a little bit about the phytopharmaceuticals. So already there is a brief introduction. So I'll be speaking more in detail about what is the global scenario of the phytopharmaceutical, what other countries have done. Before India started these regulations, uh, USA, in United States, China, European countries, they already created guidelines and they, they are ahead of us. But India also, in right time, they start created the guidelines. And also I'll be speaking about those guidelines, what are the requirements, how they are different than the Irish products, and how they are similar to the small molecules. Pointer is also looking pointer. Okay. Yeah, screen has a problem, so it, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So again, good afternoon to all. So I'll be speaking about uh, the title itself. I kept uh, very interesting, like phytopharmaceutical, a new hope for uplifting the traditional medicine in India. So in the due course of my talk, you'll understand why I written this statement. So before I start my presentation, I'll just for the sake of the audience, uh, for the students, I'll briefly talk about what is this institute where I'm working since last 12 years. So uh, CSR, Indian Institute of Integrative Medicine. So this institute was created before the independence of India. So if you can see the in 1941, uh, can I get the pointer, another point? Yeah, so this institute was created, uh, established in 1941 uh, under the state government with the name as Drug Research Laboratory, DRL. And this laboratory was created by this person called as Sir Ramnath Chopra. He was the founder director of this institute. And this land, whole land was belonging to this person and he gifted this land to the institute. So and he, he if, if you see my upcoming slide, he is called as the father of Indian pharmacology also. So in uh, 1941 to 57, this uh, was under the state, gov state government. And when CSR started in uh, 1950, this lab was given to the CSR, taken by the central government. And then from that uh, time, the name of the lab was changed as Regional Research Laboratory, RRL Jammu. And from 1957 to 2007, almost for 40 to 50 years, this, it was no, well known as a RRL Jammu. And after, in 2007, CSR realized the mandate of this institute, like translating the uh, traditional knowledge with the and integrating that with the modern biology. So based upon that uh, integ uh, knowledge, the name of the institute was changed to Indian Institute of Integrative Medicine from 2007. And this lab was well known for isolating the bulk natural product like very well known example, belladone alkaloids, santonin, diazinin. So scientists used to isolate this natural product, pure quantity in bulk quantities, kg quantities. And they used to get exported to the European countries. So in the due course of my talk, these are the uh, four points I'll be speaking about. Like I'll talk about, first I'll speak about what are the regulations of traditional medicine, what is the global status, and then specifically I'll speak about the, what is US FDA condition, what is the status of US FDA guidelines, and then I'll speak about the Indian, India, uh, Indian guidelines. Then what are the opportunities, and what are the initiatives taken by the CSR in phytopharmaceuticals, and then I'll show you, link this, my, whatever I speak here, I will link with the one or two case studies from our own research. So before I start my presentation, so briefly about what, as a uh, individual research group, I work. So I work in this uh, four broad pillars, but each and each pillar is linked with each other. Like I uh, mainly focus my research on the phytochemical investigation of Indian medicinal plant to discover the bioactive compounds. So that is the initial basic research we start. And once we work, uh, get something pure natural product, if you get in good quantity, uh, we find that compounds are bioactive. 
then we take some of the interesting leads for the natural medicinal chemistry and in medicinal chemistry our research is focused mainly on the oncology and CNS diseases. In oncology our focus is mainly on the kinases, protein kinases and one of the discovery which we discovered in last uh, 10 years, one of that candidate has gone to the clinical trial for pancreatic cancer. So that even I am not speaking here, only my lecture is focused on the phytopharmaceuticals. So another path, once we identify something pure natural pot as a very, showing very interesting biological activity, then we consider that as a great opportunity to see as a whole extract or as a enriched fraction, whether that we can develop as a phytopharmaceuticals or nutraceuticals. So that pathway we follow in those cases, some of the examples I'll show you here. So how we started doing the basic research and how we converted that into the phytopharmaceutical products. And ultimate aim in both these cases is do the preclinical development of those. So in case of small molecule, we follow this IND filing we call it as, in nutraceutical we call it as a commercialization, and in phytopharmaceutical also we have to go for IND filing, clinical validation, so that we do. So briefly about the, what is the global scenario, so briefly uh, this slide summarizes like this glo globally this herbal medicine is considered as an important alternative medicine for uh, allopathic, uh, allopathic drugs. So only, but a problem is that only few medicinal herbs have been scientifically validated and that is the reason people still do not prefer the Ayurvedic medicine, they mainly rely on the allopathic medicines. And reason is like they are very poorly regulated, they are no, standardization is way for way, only very few drugs there is a proper standardization is done. And recently this EVS FDA also, they reported some of the uh, adverse effect, if, if events, like there was safety concerns for some, for some of the uh, herbal drugs. Almost there were 50,000 adverse effects were reported for some of the botanicals and dietary supplement. And this was the, this was the concern that they created a separate guidelines, in stringent guidelines in uh, line with the small molecule drugs. And they realized this opportunity and they created the first set of guidelines in 2004 uh, and the first revision was done in the August 2015. And understanding these guidelines, then India also came forward. They started working on those guidelines and first version was launched in 2013 and final guidelines were launched in the November 2015. So from here, the actual opportunity for the Indian uh, scientists, those who were working on the medicinal plant, that, that, that was started. So what is the, the if you look at the global scenario, whether there, there are all the countries are having at least some sort of the regulation for herbal medicine uh, or traditional medicine. So you can see this uh, whole uh, picture. The red ones uh, clearly reflect that there are no any kind of guidelines are there for herbal regulation. Anybody can take any herbal medicine without any guidelines. So, but most of the countries have at least some sort of the guidelines. These blue color portions, you can see that there are some regulations. But if, even though there are regulations, whether these guidelines are really in line with the small molecules, that is another question. You can see here. So, uh, from that another survey done by the WHO, it was observed that out of 100 countries, only 47 countries are having exactly similar level of stringent guidelines like the pharmaceuticals or we call it as a small molecules. And the, this uh, initial survey was done in 1999 and after 12 years they realized that whether there is an increase in the awareness or creation of new guidelines for the for this herbal medicines, you can see clearly the difference. Like countries are coming forward and they are creating guidelines, they are creating regulations for herbal medicine. Even some of the countries they are taking initiatives to set up national research institutes for traditional medicine. Some of the, India has a lot of uh, uh, Irish institutes who are working on traditional medicine. So this is kind of one of the great up initiative taken by many countries. Like there are 73 countries where there are institutes which are mainly focusing on the traditional medicine. So I'll be speaking about these three important set of guidelines like EVS FDA. And they refer these guidelines as a botanicals. They call it as a botanical. And European countries, they call it as HMPs, which called as herbal medicinal product. And in 2004, this EVS FDA launched the guidelines. In 2008, Europe EMA has launched and in 2015 uh, CDSCO has launched the guidelines. So uh, just, just now I spoke about the 2004, this USFDA started the guidelines and then in almost now 18 years are completed since these guidelines are launched. But before this launch of the guidelines, they realized the opportunities and from 1985 onwards they started taking the IND applications. So I'll show you the uh, how many applications they see. Almost they received 900 IND applications. This is a huge number. And what is the success rate you see? Out of this 900 application, almost 50, uh, 200 to 300 gone to the clinical trials and only two got the approval. So two, only two NDA submissions. So out of this 900, only two NDA submissions and uh, most surprising fact is that we are sitting on the gold mine, we have huge biodiversity, but not a single IND application to the US FDA from India. So that is one of the surprising fact. 
So what the, according to the USFD, what is the definition of uh, botanicals? Like they consider any product coming from the plant materials, algae, microscopic fungi, or combination. So they are kept very kept very broad uh, definition. Like they are not only restricted to plant materials. Even if you develop something from the uh, algae, even microscopic fungi, that can be developed as a phytopharmaceutical. And here only the Indian, Indian farm phytopharmaceutical, they are only restricted to the plant materials. This is one of the I think a change which we needs to be made like something someone is developing algae product that should be considered under the phytopharmaceuticals and these are the things which are not con considered under the phytopharmaceuticals like fermentation products and something coming from the animals they are not uh, they do not fall under the botanicals so this is the guideline and just a snapshot i shown here then coming to the Yeah, this is the statistic, like uh, IND applications for the uh, USFDA started in 1984, and you can see the increase in the number of IND applications. So this is the statistic, nearly, nearly 900 pre-INDs and IND submissions they got. And most interesting and liberal fact of the USFDA is that if there is a traditional knowledge is already reported, you don't need to do the, all this regulatory safety formulas in animals. You directly, you can get the permission to do the clinical trial, but which is not uh, accepted by the Indian regulator. So this is uh, one of the bottleneck here. So out of this 965% are single herbs, 35% are the multiple herbs, and there is a more contribution for oncology. Out of uh, maybe 100 drugs, like 34% is for the oncology product. And currently there are several in the phase two, 2% 2 are in phase three. So very few are reaching to the phase three. And that is the reason only two NDA submitted and both have got FDA approved. And another interesting fact, like somebody from the US FDA, I listened to that presentation. Out of this 900 pre-INDs, from where they are getting the raw material, so 30% of the botanical raw material they are getting from the India. But India is not finding any IND application. 30% from India and almost 30% from the China they are getting the raw material. And they are doing the research in the United States and they are filing the INDs. So these are the two botanical drugs which are got, got the FDA approval. Like first one was approved in the 2006 which is a mixture of uh, synecatechins obtained from the leaves of the Camellia sinensis. And it is a topical formulation for the genital wards. And in 2012, another FDA, they got the, the approved. This is the first oral botanical drug approved by US FDA. It is a full swag and it is commercially available for the taking care of the diarrhea in HIV patients. So this, this product was developed by one South American country. There is a plant called as a Croton lechery and this plant is traditionally used in South America for uh, anti-diarrheal properties, uh, uh, fever, treatment of fever and those kind of things. Based upon their traditional knowledge, they had got the permission from US FDA directly conducted the phase two clinical trial and they got the permission to launch in the market this product 2012. So now uh, after USFDA, I'll briefly have to, I'll talk about the what are the regulations in the European countries. So there is an agency called as European Medical Agency. This agency regulates the drug approvals in the in, uh, Europe, whole Europe. So they call it as a HMPs, herbal medicinal products. And, and under the European countries, these are the three different categories that they have clearly classified like there is a traditional knowledge is available you don't know, need to do any uh, animal toxicology directly you can get the permission and do the clinical trial second category is that well established use that means at least for 10 years that particular medicinal plant has to be in the human consumption use and that too in uh, european countries if that kind of database is there even though it is not traditionally used there also you can skip this animal pharmacology you can directly do the clinical trial and third category is a standalone, like you have to generate a whole lot of data, even chemical standardization, everything you have to generate like a small molecule, and then only you can get the uh, approval. So these are the three categories. And they launched this guideline in 2008, and recently second revision they published in 2016. So coming to the uh, Indian, uh, what is the Indian situation now? So before this, uh, CDSCO launched the guidelines, the initially the, there were guidelines of the Ayush. So they uh, create, uh, launched, uh, created some guidelines in 2006, uh, for conducting the clinical trial. And after that, DCGI launched this guideline in November 2015. And parallelly, uh, FSSI, this is a basically for food, food supplements. They had some guidelines, rules and regulations for the food safety and standards. In 2011, they created. But in no November 2016, they added another category called as a uh, dietary supplements for health benefits. So that, that is another category called as a nutraceutical or functional foods. So this category is very important. They clearly listed almost 400 medicinal plants where they specified the range of the compound. Like uh, I'll show you on the next slide here. Like for example, uh, this is the FSA guideline launched in the November 2016. So there is a list of 400 uh, medicinal plants under the schedule for they listed. 
they clearly mention, for example, this plant, you can consume 5 to 10 grams per day. So this much range, if you are con uh, containing in your product, you, you, don't, you, know, you don't have to do any clinical trial, any sanitization, directly that much quantity you can launch in the product, uh, you can launch the product directly under the, as a nutraceutical for health benefits. So, based upon these two interesting guidelines created in two, or almost 2015 or 16, this has created a great opportunity for working in this uh, field and to, gen to scientifically validate this traditional knowledge and generate the products out of these. So this is the phytopharmaceutical guideline, the very important one. So this is the guideline which is clearly defines that you have to prepare the standardized fraction, you have to standardize with four markers, not necessarily they should be bioactive, they should be phytochemical compound, they should be present in that extract, but always uh, based upon my experience, at least one of the compounds should be bioactive, then only we can trace the biological activity. Without that, it is very difficult to trace the biological activity. So these new regulations have created the great opportunity and this product, whatever will come out of this, they will be accepted by the modern medical profession. So what exactly is required under the phytopharmaceutical? These are the actual guidelines I just uh, mentioned here. So first part of the IND dossier, whenever you want to do any clinical trial, you have to submit some documentation called as IND dossier to the regulator. And that the doc doc document should contain, these are the important information. The part of the document is already known information. The, before you start your work, what is literature available in the information like? Brief description of the or summary of the drug. What is the published literature on this particular plant? Whether any side effects are already reported in the literature? So all those you have to summarize here. Then any human clinical pharmacology that you have to summarize. Second part is the data, data which you generated as a part of this development process. So this is very important part and which is actually called as a CMC, Chemistry, Manufacturing and Control. This is the where the mainly uh, all the phytopharmaceutical or Irish products are failing. You, you do not get the efficacy. The, sometimes you get the toxicity. What is the reason? The reason comes to the secondary metabolite. There is a not poor standardization of those. So these are the parameters like you have to uh, taxonomically identify the raw material. You have to do all macroscopic, microscopic studies, uh, even me heavy metal content loading. So all those uh, parameters you have to do. Total ash, everything is mentioned. Pesticide content, heavy metal you have to do and mainly this assay for bioactive or phytochemical compounds that you have to do. Even for the raw material and even for your PAPI. PAPI is phytopharmaceutical API, so that also you have to do. Second process is quality control. So uh, what are the steps you are using for the making the PAPI, like what solvent you are using, what is the extractive value to get the, uh, that, uh, your API. Uh, all these tests, microwave load, heavy metal content, you have to, everything you have to do as a part of the uh, quality control standardization, uh, everything you have to complete. And then formulation development, because this phytopharmaceutical, since it's a botanical drug, only oral option is there. So you have to develop a product and everything, all details you have to provide. And even this stability data, as per the small molecule, like you have to complete the stability under the two, uh, two separate uh, conditions, like one condition is uh, short-term condition uh, and one is long-term condition. So that stability data you have to generate under the, these two different conditions. Then most important is the GLP regulatory toxicology, exactly like the small molecules. You have to generate the animal toxicology data like acute toxicity, then 20 days to 90 days. Depends upon the disease where your therapeutic condition is there, uh, you, may, you may have to do the 90 days toxicity also. Then genotoxicity data, AIM test you have to do, DNA, this chromosome aberration test, dermal toxicity for topical products, all these data you have to generate as a part of IND dossier. So briefly about what is the difference between small molecule and phytopharmaceutical now. So mainly this, these are the three parameters where they differ. Like CMC is the major component. Like in small molecule, you simply see the purity or assay of the compound, whether the compound is 99% pure or what is the percentage of impurity. So these are the two important parameters. Whereas in phytopharmaceutical, you have to do the chemical standardization with the four markers. You have to check the repeatability of the drug candidate. Whether you have collected the material in June and you have collected it in December, you are getting the same con content of the markers. You collected one plant from the northeast and one collector from the southern India, whether you are getting the same content. So that kind of repeatability and those kind of things are very, very important here. And your product should be devoid of these aflatoxins, pesticides, and heavy metal. Second component of the CMC is the, like in small molecule, you have to do the pilot synthesis or under the schedule M. Here also exactly similar you have to do. You have to do the GMP manufacturing under the schedule M. Not like Irish product, Irish product accept the schedule T, but here you have to follow the schedule M guidelines. Here, formulation, any type, oral, uh, IV, anything you can do, but in case of phytopharmaceutical only, capsule, tablets, and syrups are possible. Under the GLP, regular toxicology, I think everything is similar. Same level of data is required. ADM studies, in small molecules, you have to clearly show the PK, dose-dependent PK, tissue distribution, everything in detail you have to show. 
But in phytopharmaceutical as such, there is no any requirement of doing the PK. But for the sake of the scientists, because we were working on the perpetual plant, and you know that what is your bioactive marker. So you have to track that bioactive marker, whether that is really reaching to the blood circulation. That is a confirmative PK you have to conduct. Now, what are the opportunities in phytopharmaceutical or botanical? So these are the two pillars I mentioned. There is a wealth of traditional knowledge available in India. Like there are Ayurvedic tradition, Ayurvedic knowledge is there. Even this Unani Siddha medicine, they are also based upon the medicinal plants. So all this traditional knowledge, there is a clinical use is there. Uh, people are using since ancient times. So that knowledge you have to do the scientific validation using the modern biology and proper thorough CMC data. So this, this, uh, this is the kind of opportunity. And resource availability, like rich biodiversity, a lot of plant, plants are there. Even many plants are uh, not even explored for in their phytochemistry also. And there is a diverse expertise available in the country. There are several medicine, natural pot chemists. They are just wasting their time on doing the, some other work rather than spending their time on the uh, exploring this product uh, towards the product development. So if you do the scientific validation, you can go to the phytopharmaceutical or even you can do the reverse pharmacology. Like you can come down to the small molecule and that small molecule you can develop as a small uh, as a drug product. So I will show you one of the example of the reverse pharmacology also. So according to me, the ideal path for phytopharmaceutical drug development is like you need a robust natural product chemistry. Without that, I, I don't think phytopharmaceutical good product you can develop. Not only is it safety and efficacy because if you develop a proper, proper do the natural product chemistry, do proper thorough chemical standardization, you are bound to get the efficacy. Because efficacy is already documented in literature, in traditional literature. So this robust chemistry is required and that is the reason I mentioned here. Robust CMC is the key for the product development under the phytopharmaceutical guidelines. So this is the example of the reverse pharmacology. So this term was launched by this, coined by this person called as Ramnath Chopra. So he initially, the plant called as Rolfia serpentina, this is being traditionally used for the hypertension. And based upon his research, he identified the pure natural product, which is actually showing the anti-type hypertension activity. And later on, this reserpine, which is a major component of this plant, it, this pure natural product became a drug as anti-hypertension. This is a kind of, kind of a reverse pharmacology. Now, what are the initiatives of the CSR? These guidelines are launched in the 2015. Immediately, CSR took the initiatives in 2015 itself, and they start, wanted to start one uh, pan-CSR project, mission project. We call it as a mission project. So in 2016, we started writing a proposal, and we submitted a uh, mission project with eight labs. I will complete in uh, another five minutes. So eight labs came forward. Triple M was the nodal lab, and we selected some of the interesting medicinal plant where we can develop the product. Uh, under this mission, uh, eight medicinal plants were chosen for phytopharmaceutical uh, drug development. Out of this, although we cannot complete all uh, IND applications of all eight plants, but only one IND we could file, and that from the, our lab, so I will be discussing this one IND. And also, a lot of uh, big pipeline is created for the future development. So after completion of this phase one, recent and now currently phase two started, under this, these six labs are there. Again, we are leading this, triple M is the nodal lab, and six medicinal plants we have chosen, and project is currently ongoing. So our efforts now, we're coming to the efforts from our lab. Briefly, in the next four or five slides, I will show you my effort in this phytopharmaceutical domain. These are the three plants we have been working since last 10 years, I'm telling. And only last, since last five years, we actually started working on phytopharmaceutical. First five years, we spent on the natural pot chemistry. So Virginia Sileta, this is a Himalayan plant which occurs in the temperate Himalayas. And it is already documented in Ayurvedic Pharmacopoeia. And there is already one product in the market for the treatment of kidney stones. And this natural product is present in abundance. This virginin, there is a natural product called a virginin, beautiful natural product present in abundance in this plant and occurs in temperate Himalayas. Another plant is a crocus saffron and third is a diazosalum. So why we selected this plant and our effort on this plant, these three plants was based on the pure natural product. We first get the feeling on this pure natural product, whether these natural products are stable, they are really showing the efficacy, uh, what is the PK profile of this individual natural product? We work on those things and then only we started working on phytopharmaceuticals. So these two examples I will speak in uh, uh, my coming slides. This I could not speak because, uh, because of the time. But uh, interestingly, this natural product, we diverted to the two directions, like one direction for the phytopharmaceutical. This natural product, you can see this is a chrome one alkaloid. This is very potent inhibitor of TNF alpha. So this direction we took for the phytopharmaceutical drug development for the rheumatoid arthritis. And another direction, like this is a very potent inhibitor of the CDK, CDK9. And already this drug has a natural pot. This is a plant which occurs in India. And this has given the two clinical candidates, flavopyridol and P276, developed by Pyramal. And both have, both have gone to the phase three clinical trial for pancreatic cancer. 
and here we discovered an oral candidate from this and that is called as a triple M290 and that we are taken to the clinical trial. We got the permission from the regulator and soon we'll start the clinical trial. So that I will not speak here. So this is the first plant, Virginia Silita. I summarize everything here. Like we started working on this Virginia Silita. We took the aerial plant. We prepared the Virginia rich extract and fraction. So before going ahead for the phytopharmaceutical, we work on this pure natural. We isolated in good quantity. We did medicinal chemistry. We series synthesized almost 20 compounds. And all these uh, new derivatives as well as the virginin, we tested in vitro assays like we tested for IL-6, TNF alpha, uh, then in vivo models, a lot of in vivo models like uh, nociception pain models as well as inflammation. Because in rheumatoid arthritis, there, is a, there are two important parameters like pain as well as the inflammation. So this particular natural product is uh, acting against the both, like it is anti-pain as well as the anti-IL-6. It is not inhibiting TNF alpha. TNF alpha is a kind of a liability because a lot of uh, TNF alpha antibodies, US FDA has created the black box warning because that increases the risk of the HIV infections, tuberculosis. And once if it, something you discover which is selective for IL-6, that is considered as a very gold mine. So this compound is not inhibiting TNF alpha, but only inhibiting IL-6. So it, we call it as a dual IL-6 and anti-nociceptive uh, compound. And this medicinal chemistry work we published in JMedChem. We filed a IP on the pure natural product. And later on, we realized that there is a potential in this natural product. This is present in abundance in this plant. Then we prepared the PEPI. We validated this API, PAPI in in vitro, in vivo models. We did regulatory toxicology studies, acute, acute toxicity in rats and mice. 20 HJ stocks, general pharmacology, everything we did uh, as per the GLP guidelines. We developed oral formulation. Because to get to enter into the phytopharmaceutical, another hurdle is the getting a IP on this. Getting a patent on medicinal plant is the next uh, difficult task. And this you have to get the permission from the biodiversity board. So we play, prepared a novel formulation, gastroretentive formulation here. And reason for making gastroretentive formulation is like virgin in US in the structure, it has a lactone moiety. And we have observed that under the intestinal pH, that lactone limb gets opened. And once it gets it go open, it does not have any uh, biological activity. So to protect this uh, virginin from the intestinal tract, we prepared a gastroretentive formulation so that it does not cross the pyloric sphincter. It floats on the, in the GIT itself and from there it gets absorbed. So based upon this novel formulation, we can see the increase in the AUC also, threefold increase in the AUC compared with the plain extract. So from this, we got the IP on this filed IP, and this work also we published. And uh, since we are already working in the phytopharmaceutical domain, we are, because that takes time, you have to do the all uh, non-rodent, rodent toxicity, a lot of money is required. Uh, so before uh, filing, uh, even we plan to license this product in a nutraceutical mode. So last year, we licensed this product to the Viridis Biopharma to launch in the market as a nutraceutical. So last year, only we did this. And parallelly, we signed agreement with this Viridis company. So jointly, we are developing a you know, phytopharmaceutical guidelines. So already we filed IND application. Now, we soon we'll start the clinical trial, phase one clinical trial in healthy volunteers. This is the clinical trial protocol which we propose in IND dozier. And this we are proposing because this has a dual effect on the uh, IL-6 inhibition and anti So managing, managing the pain in the RA, this is the uh, therapeutic indication for this. Another plant is a Crocus sativus. So this plant, why we started, so briefly about why, what, is the, what happens in Alzheimer's. So this is the comparison with the normal brain, Alzheimer's brain. In normal brain and Alzheimer's C, there are the two pathologies, neurofibrillary triangles, they get deposited inside the neurons, and there are amyloid beta blocks in between the neurons. These are the two pathologies which block the neurotransmission and cause the neuronal damage. So uh, how we can clear this amyloid beta plex? There is a protein called as a PGP, which is located at the blood vein barrier. And that is the actually the regulator or it helps in the clearance of the amyloid beta. So there are two clinical studies published in 2010 when we started working in this area that they identified that decreased clearance of A-beta is the actual culprit for Alzheimer's disease. So based upon this hypothesis, we thought that we, uh, in Alzheimer's patient, there's a decreased level of PGP. That is the reason that A-beta get deposited. So we wanted to discover something which can upregulate this PGP. So how we can do that? We can uh, activate this PXR. This is a nuclear receptor which actually regulate the PGP and so that A-beta from the brain gets uh, export, uh, exported from the brain to the blood circulation. So based upon this hypothesis, we started a big medicine program. A uh, lot of synthetic scaffold we selected, almost 200 compounds we synthesized from my group only. And also, also some of the natural pot libraries we screen. These are the, some of the interesting hits we observed, we published, we got a lot of patents here. But from natural pot library, we got one compound which is showing interesting uh, in, uh, increase in the A-beta clearance, even in the animal model. And this is called as a crocin-1. 
So this is the compound. This is the aglaucan moiety, and there are sugar moieties. That this is the crocin which is present in the saffron. This is the major component. 35% of the saffron extract contains this crocin one. So this is the HPLC profile. This is the crocin one, and rest all are also crocins. So only they differ by the sugar moieties. So we, it doesn't matter because in, we observe that once it goes to the stomach, everything gets cleaved. Only this crocitin goes to the blood circulation, and it actually crosses the blood-brain barrier. So we are not bothered that these compounds are present. Everything ultimately is getting converted to the transcrocitin. So we did animal studies in transgenic mice model with the US collaborator, and we observed that even this crocin one as well as the extract showing interesting value, uh, uh, increase in the EBITDA clearance. Then we wanted to develop a phytopharmaceutical lead out of this. We prepared the PEAPI. Then PEAPI also we did in vitro studies, uh, like it enhances the blood membrane integrity. A lot of in vitro studies, I will not speak in detail about this. We validated this PEPI in the transgenic mice model called as a 5X FAD model. Here also it has increased the clearance, induced the expression of PGP, LRP1, autophagy. Not only by this PGP mechanism, but it also induces the autophagy. That is another mechanism to clear the toxins out of the body. And we observed that not only this extract, but we observed that since we know that transcrocitin is actually the bioactive marker, plant does not contain the transcrocitin, only crocins, sugar mort is here. But when we did the PQ of the extract and the crocin, we observed that whatever in the blows in the blood is a transcrocetin. And we also did the brain PK in brain also transcrocetin is reaching. So this pure compound we synthesized in good quantity. We tested this pure compound also in vitro in vivo. And this compound exactly re results are replicated here. So this is another interesting validation of our extract. Pure compound is showing activity and extract is showing the activity. And these are the publications, good quality of publications came out of the extract and this work. And then we develop a formulation because ultimately phytopharmaceutical you have to develop a formulation. You have to get the IP on this because you have to spend a lot of money on this. So in another two minutes, I'll complete my presentation. We prepared a sustained release granules. Since these crocins are highly hydrophilic in nature, a lot of sugar moieties are there. So it is very difficult to cross the barrier. And uh, even this trans also uh, uh, to get uh, cross that, we prepared a sustained release formulation. And this formulation has helped to increase the uh, plasma levels of this trans by almost fourfold. So based upon this uh, inventive step, one of the parameters required for patent is an inventive step. We got IP on this, and these are the unique features of this. Then we completed ADME studies, a regulatory toxicology. These are some of the studies that are ongoing right now. This project is ongoing. So very soon we'll file the IND application now. But before going for the IND application, this product also we licensed to the one of the company in 2018 itself we launched, and they are launching them. They are planning to launch this product in the United States, and then, then they will launch in the Indian market uh, with the brand name of Safrentine. And currently, we are developing, in a, developing this as in a phytopharmaceutical route also. So uh, concluding remarks, like there is a huge opportunity. We, have to do the, we can do the scientific validation of traditional knowledge. And you, do the, you can do the reverse pharmacology so that you can get the phytopharmaceutical leads as well as the small molecule leads. Even while doing the scientific validation, you can get come to the pure natural pot, which are showing very important activity. That those natural pot, you can pursue medicinal chemistry. And you can get another fruits here to get something which can go to the uh, IND filing for, in a small molecule route. So finally, in, uh, I, I must acknowledge my primary workforce. Like these are the students uh, during this last 10 years. This 10, 12 students graduated from my group. And these are the seven uh, PhD students who are currently doing PhD with me. Uh, uh, these are the students who completed PhD. And they are, they are all of the students are really working in very reputed institutes. Recently, last week, only this student has defended her thesis. And very soon, she will be joining uh, postdoc in Purdue University. And I must acknowledge my biology partners, outsourcing partners, because all GLP talks we did with here, funding agencies, because of this one, it was possible to complete all the studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep, for a very absorbing and excellent presentation. It's open for discussion, maybe one quick question. One question. Yeah, yeah. So, <coughs> One of the molecules like use license for the rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. So it is just to pour the pain or inflammation or it is just uh, like mechanistically also reducing the immunological markers? Yeah. So we tested in the collagen into the arthritis model. That is the model which is actually recapitulate the human pathophysiology. We check the two antibodies, this IgG1, IgG2. So they, they are also getting reduced. So both we check. So any reference drug you selected on the? So uh, actually we should have used the methotrexate, but we use dexamethasone. That is the ideal one, without exit. Thank you. I think, uh, thank you, Sandeep, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, the other students, audience can interact with him later on, whatever queries they have. Sure. Okay, thank you. So I uh, 
invite i think our chair to felicitate dr sandeep Yeah, again, uh, we have now the last speaker of the session, Dr. Mahendra Bishnoi, who is a senior scientist at our neighboring institute, National Agri-Food Biotechnology, we say NABI uh, at Mohali. So he has been working here since last 10 years in this institute and work in the field of nutrition and uh, employing several cereals, millets, as the nutritional supplements. And apart from that, he also worked on three phytomolecules, capsaicin, cinnamaldehyde, and menthol, as the active ingredients in several food ingredients. And he has a lot of awards, fellowships, and published extensively. We do have collaboration with him at Nabi Mohali. So with this, I invite Dr. Mandra to present his work uh, today. Thank you. menthol induced uh, pharmacological uh, cold mimicking so uh, what uh, actually we do at nabi first of all i would just like to explain in one slide where i, I work in food and nutrition department so our focus is mainly through food can can food act as medicine and if yes because there is a lot of literature old literature saying that food can act as medicine if it can act, how and why? Can we give the proofs? Can we give enough evidences to uh, support our uh, uh, support this fact that food can be act, can act as medicine? Be it be a preventive medicine or a promotive medicine, and our focus is towards this. And in that, we have a program which is uh, around uh, this specific type of uh, receptors which are called transient receptor potential channels they are ion channel type of receptors and why we are focusing on them i will be coming on the next slide and our focus is to develop nutraceuticals spiceuticals or pharmaceuticals for obesity and type 2 diabetes these TRP channels were in news last year because the, the discoverer of these, Professor David Julius and Adam Patapitin, they received Nobel Prize last year for the discovery of TRP channels through using capsaicin and other molecules which are uh, natural molecules. So why TRP channels when we talk about obesity? TRP channels are this ion channel type of receptors and these are we call them molecular thermometers they are 28 in numbers they are six transmembrane with both c and n terminals intracellularly and they are sensory in nature these are the receptors through which we sense cold we sense hot we sense pain we have different kind of pains oriented through these type of receptors 
they are present in gut, brain, and adipose tissue. These are the three tissues which are very important for metabolism, and they are present there. They are the most important thing what I would say is that they are activated by number of dietary components. That, that make it a very interesting target to study when we talk about food and diet. So they are activated. For example, the first TRP channel which was discovered was TRP V1, phenyloid 1, and it is activated by capsaicin, which is an active constituent of chilies. Then there TRP A1, TRP M8, about which I will be talking more in length in my talk. There, TRP M8 is activated by menthol, you all know it, it's a constituent of mints. Then TRP A1, activated by cinnamaldehyde, uh, allicin, they are the part of uh, constituents of uh, cinnamon, garlic, onion. So, in general, we can say that these, channel, these channels are activated by number of dietary components and which made us to work on them because we, we are more interested in uh, studying uh, diet and food. They all are calcium permeable and calcium permeability has a role in adipogenesis and obesity and then at the end it is thermoregulation which I will be targeting. That is the reason why we started studying them. You all know this, obesity is a problem and then because it, it is a problem and it is also associated with 53 other disorders. So both way it is a problem. Can we prevent it? Yes, we can prevent it. The logic which we give in our lab and at, at our institute is there is energy intake and energy expenditure. Lot of, uh, lot of research and lot of focus and easy target is the energy intake. Everybody is saying you, you eat less, you you decrease your energy intake that may result into prevention of weight gain and uh, prevention of obesity in general. But these two go hand in hand, energy intake and energy expenditure. The focus what we have is energy expenditure can also be targeted in a way that if you enhance energy expenditure as compared to energy intake, you are in general improving metabolic health. And there are a number of research articles, research papers addressing that when you increase energy expenditure, this will result into overall better metabolic health rather than you compromise yourself for the, uh, by eating less and decreasing energy intake that may have different kind of complications. So it's always a balance. So we focus on enhancing energy expenditure. Why do we, how do we do that? That is through this, uh, this is a graph which I will be explaining here. You can see there is thermo neutral zone and when you go beyond thermoneutral zone, both towards uh, the higher side of temperature and lower side of temperature, when you go towards cold, towards warm, it enhances your, in general, ambient metabolic rate. Interestingly, when you go towards the cold, it is increasing your metabolic rate more than if you are going towards warm. So we focused on the cold part of it. So this is non... Uh, Shivering thermogenesis, this is shivering thermogenesis. So if you go towards the colder side, if you sense cold and uh, towards cold, it will increase your, it will increase your metabolic rate in general. And that metabolic rate increase is more than what you go towards warm. So we focused on the cold side because these TRP channels, all of them are uh, molecular thermometers. They, some of them senses warm, some of them senses cold. And there is enough literature and you all might be aware by your experience also, when you are in cold, they say that you are expending more energy because you have to keep yourself warm, you expend more energy. So our hypothesis is this. So can we, can we create a pharmacological cold mimicking? You don't need to go in cold. Can you do something so that you mimic a cold condition and what your physiology will do is exactly what if you are in 10 degree or 16 degree outside in cold, can, is it possible? That, that was the question. So we, we addressed it in a way that So I will explain this slide first so that you will connect it and then I will go back to slide. So th these are all the TRP channels and you see here it is clearly, I, I have explained this is the temperature at which they are active. So you can see this is TRP M8, 
it is active on the temperature in between 10 to 20 which is innocuous cold so it is cold but it is not noxious cold so it is not causing a un unwanted actions not the noxious actions it is not, ca not causing cold induced pain or something but it is innocuous and we targeted this receptor so now when you are in cold you are sensing cold this receptor which is present in the sensory uh, efferent endings on your skin it is it is activated and it gives the message to drg and brain and through that you sense cold so uh, we we asked ourselves that if we pharmacologically activate it will it be the same effect so trp m8 is activated by menthol menthol is a very very active uh, very very well researched active component which activates strip M8. So we focused on menthol to develop a concept related to this. Also, when we say cold induced activation, cold induced thermogenesis, cold induced adaptive thermogenesis, it is more <coughs> focused on how we will do it. So when, when we sense cold, in our body we have two types of adipose tissue, white adipose tissue and brown adipose tissue. White adipose tissue is for the energy storage and brown adipose tissue is energy expenditure. Brown adipose tissue is rich in mitochondria and it expands energy. So what happens is that uh, brown adipose tissue is very much in rodents, mice especially and in younger kids. It was up before 2009 it was very well validated and it was uh, said that the, it is not present in adult humans and if at all it is present it is not. Uh, functionally present but as I am showing you on this slide in 2009 there came three papers in New England Journal of Medicine <coughs> doing clinical studies to prove that adult humans do have functional brown adipose tissue that means you can now use this functional brown adipose uh, brown adipose tissue to use strategies to activate it to enhance it so that you will you can uh, you can uh, take the benefits out of it because you can activate it you can enhance energy expenditure and that in result will increase energy expenditure and decrease in weight gain and increase in thermogenesis so these were the three papers from different groups at the same time and they they said the same thing you can clearly see there is a presence of uncoupling protein in, and you can see the brown adipose tissue light up here in the pet and ct uh, images and all so brown adipose tissue is functional and there is enough evidence which I am showing here in rodents also there is enough evidence that cold can activate brown adipose tissue. Third one, recent literature seven, eight years back they found out another type of adipose tissue which is called bright. Bright is the type of white adipose tissue with the characteristics of brown adipose tissue means it is white in general. But because of the changes what we are facing, dietary changes, environmental changes and other changes what we are facing and doing it, the white is change, having a characteristics of brown. So it is now not the energy storing one, it is now the energy expanding one. So the white is converting into uh, brown and they name it bright. So <coughs> cold has a possibility of making these white adipose tissue being converted into white so means they will increase mitochondria in them they will increase ucp expression in them and they will change it in a way that now it is more energy expenditure so now if i summarize till now trp m8 is a cold receptor cold sensing receptor menthol can pharmacologically mimic that cold sensation and cold can activate brown adipose tissue and then can it can it can extrapolate uh, the effects of uh, ad adaptive thermogenesis in a way that we can use it for uh, enhancing energy expenditure. Yeah, and then uh, there are other studies in last few years which has clearly shown that trp m 8 is a receptor which is responsible for cold. This was very interesting study which I always uh, try to explain that mice are cold sensitive but squirrels and hamsters are not. The reason being presence of trp m 8 this is very, very elegant study done by uh, this group, Gracia Labs, where they mutated trp m 8 present in uh, mice and squirrels. They alternated it and in a way, mice lost its cold sensitivity and squirrels 
now were cold sensitive. So that means TRP M8 is responsible for the cold sensitivity what these animals are having. Uh, then another one because we will we 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 are we were planning to study menthol orally. So it is important to understand whether TRP M8 is present in gut also. TRP M8 is very well present in gut, and it is responsible for. There are papers saying that. Uh, these herbal remedies will pe with peppermint and all they have a potential to act as trip m8 agonist and pharmacological can inhibit reduce uh, abdominal pain so there is trip m8 in gut and it can based on all this the concept or hypothesis what we developed was that it is just like in skin we, where we have this cold sensation the presence of trip m8 in gut through sensory efferent nerves, uh, sensory efferent endings and going through DRG to nerve, through brain can come back and send a signal to adipose tissue to enhance energy expenditure through sympathetic innervations and many other ways. But they can, <coughs> they can initiate this. So this is our hypothesis, whether it is, uh, so then we started working on it and, but we were also, uh, when we started working on, we were focused on trying to find an intermediate because we, we, we were in the pharmacology and we, we want an intermediate. So we studied a lot of uh, uh, these uh, hormones and uh, mediators which are influenced by menthol and we found out that one of them is glucagon. When you, when you inject, uh, when you give oral menthol, glucagon increases. So taking that, then we started to build up a story. So I will just, next 10 slide, I will show you how <laughs> we proved that pharmacological cold mimicking can, uh, can do what we need. So you see glucagon, uh, th this is control, this is oral menthol, this is oral uh, topical menthol, oral isolin and topical isolin. Isolin is another active, uh, another agonist of tripamate, it is chemical agonist. The only reason why we took it was to prove that, yeah, it is through tripamate. So you see the increase in glucagon concentrations. Uh, after application of oral menthol, topical menthol, and isolin also. Then in the next slide, we used an antagonist, both with menthol as well as uh, topical menthol and uh, IP, men IP menthol. We used AMTB, an antagonist, to show that it prevented the increase in glucagon, which was happened with, uh, with menthol. So it is a trip M8 mediated phenomena, which is happening in this case. So now when you, when you sense cold, the next response of body is adaptive thermogenesis. Body increases its core body temperature because they, if they feel cold, they have to increase thermogenesis and they have to have body being warm. So their rectal temperature should increase and that's what we, we saw in our experiments with oral menthol, somehow is not working. So the oral menthol and oral isolin increased topical and uh, menthol and isolin also increased because th there are sensory nerves here and sensory nerves in gut also as I explained you. So both ways they increased <laughs> the temperature, then the presence of AMTB which is antagonist prevented this. So we can say that the increase in glucagon, the increase in temperature is mediated uh, through trip M8 and so following that acute experiment, we did one study where we used HFD induced weight gain model, high fat diet induced weight gain model for 12 weeks. And then we gave 50 to 100 mg per kg oral administration of menthol, as well as we put a one group for 10% topical administration. So to, to mimic the condition of cold actually uh, with the topical application. So, and we wanted to compare if oral and topical, <coughs> how do they behave? and how, what is the difference. So it prevented weight gain, it prevented other changes also which are associated with this. You, you see uh, even per se menthol increased adiponectin which is an anti-inflammatory agent and you see the leptin resistance is also inhibited by them. <laughs> I, I'm sorry the slides are not really clear on this. But uh, we did histology, eosin and hematoxylin stains, and you see HFD will with more hypertrophy <coughs> adipose tissues, and with menthol it prevented. With topical menthol also it prevented, and we did different analysis with that, where we could see the percentage of adipocytes with different sizes, 
then we also weighed gonadal fat pad and perirenal fat pad and overall we can say that yes the hypertrophy was limited and the size of adipocytes were uh, less in case of menthol then we did uh, rectal temperature rectal temperature was also increased in case of uh, menthol administration then we also studied glucagon levels then liver weight and liver glycogen every everything we studied glycogen uh, is important because glycogen converts into glucose and glucose is uh, glycogenolysis and glucose is then utilized more so in a in way in a way activation of glucagon machinery was there in liver so we did some gene expression analysis to prove that yes glycogenolysis as well as gluconeogenesis was enhanced some of these important uh, enzymes genes related to these enzyme pepsi k and 6 gp showed the behavior the way we want you see in case of hfd in case of menthol per se you can clearly see it is increased hfd plus menthol is also increased as compared to hfd so there is increase a uh, decrease in glycogen synthesis and increase in gluconeogenesis that means the alternative source for forming glucose were also high so in general everything signs towards more of the glucose utilization which is also a pharmacological uh, pharmacological uh, what uh, relative to more adaptive therm more thermogenesis more glucose utilization when you are glucose utilization is related to energy expenditure so more of glucose utilization here then because our whole concept was revolving around browning we studied uh, white adipose tissue and brown adipose tissue white adipose tissue to study whether they converted into bright whether they have more of the genes which are related to that and then we also studied a brown adipose tissue to see that whether it is activated or not and these are some of the important genes which are associated with the brown adipose tissue activation and we can say in general activity ucp1 pgc1 alpha prdm16 cdr they, they are also involved in uh, thermogenesis brown adipose tissue activation and all and you clearly can see that uh, menthol administration has significantly increased both in white adipose tissue as well as brown adipose tissue so we can say the bright phenotype is increased and brown adipose tissue is also increased and ucp expression is also increased when you see the histology brown adipose tissue is more having more mitochondria having more mitochondria means mitochondria are more active mitochondria are rich in iron we did iron uh, you can see here iron estimation in white adipose tissue and brown adipose tissue which was high in menthol and the genes which are related to mitochondrial activation they were also higher in menthol and uh, uh, normal test uh, ogtt test to confirm whether there is more glucose utilization prevention in insulin resistance number of other tests which prove that there was breakdown of triglycerides because there is more glycerol and fatty acids triglyceride breaks down into fatty acid and glycerol when there is more glucose utilization the ratio between insulin and glucagon was marked signing towards uh, the better metabolic profile then one last study what we did was to confirm that it is through glucagon so you if you want to confirm how do you do that we use 3t3 alveol cell lines we use serum which was from menthol treated animals so it was rich in glucagon so we applied that serum to these animals in the presence of glucagon antagonist you you see uh, when we put it in the presence of glucagon antagonist that is glucagon receptor antagonist that is l168049 the increase in ucp pgc1 alpha cd137 and tmem which was there when we treated them with menthol treated serum which was rich in glucagon and it significantly prevented it so that means the glucagon receptor antagonist bind to glucagon receptor and the, now this serum glucagon doesn't have a place to bind so it could not do what it was desired to do so that means the function the, ex the experiment the effect what we saw is because of the glucagon receptor glucagon acting on glucagon receptor in the adipose tissues and then we did some of these gcms studies to find out where how much menthol was bioavailable and and it it is significantly bioavailable although topical was more bioavailable than the oral administration uh, so this is the last slide and in general we can say that yes the oral administration of menthol as the topical administration do can activate trypamate which in, in turn 
increase serum glucagon. Serum glucagon is already reported for activation of browning, adaptive thermogenesis and all that, which results into uh, white adipose tissue, brown adipose tissue and liver changes which are associated with increase in energy expenditure and in turn can prevent HFD induced metabolic complications. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting talk, you know. I think the message is take methylone and get uh, clean. <laughs> but my, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, you know, I was just wondering uh, in the obese, which is more uh, the white fat or the brown fat? It's uh, white fat is more because uh, uh, but brown, brown fat is involved in thermogenesis, not, thermogenesis. not the white fat. No, no. Brown not fat the comes for the thermogenesis. Yes. So it, Brown fat is more like energy expanding one and yeah. in adults it, it depends on many factors like if, if we have a sedentary lifestyle brown adipose tissue in general will shrink up and we will and there are number of reports that with age brown adipose tissue goes declining and so if you have to make an effort to keep it burning. Any one question, quick question. So I think we close this session and we will have some okay. panel discussion yeah. and we will ask our expert to uh, the way forward, right? from three speakers and they were really excellent and we learned many things from each one of them. Uh, the, the last part of this session is uh, how do phytopharmaceutical and nutraceutical play important role and what is the road map, how do we sort of, uh, what are the challenges and I feel Im opportunities are immense. We have seen post COVID and even during COVID how these, you know, especially the Nutraceuticals have played such an important role. The way the market has gone up, you know, it has really tripled, uh, sometimes more, more. Zincovit, you know, which is one of the product, its market share was so high during the uh, COVID, you know, it has gone to such a large extent. So to my mind, nutraceuticals and phytoceuticals are really the, you know, they are going to play a very major role. They will occupy a lot of good segment in our uh, healthcare system. And uh, one of the speakers said, food is the medicine. I fully agree because while in DRDO, we used to think like this because, you know, our soldiers being posted in different stressful environmental conditions, you know, local, we used to see local. Whatever is locally available is the best source of the food because whatever grows locally in those harsh environment has good secondary metabolites, which can give a lot of protection to the human system. 
So, uh, you know, the challenges are immense, but then this is how everyone uh, perceives it, phyto, uh, phytopharmaceutical and nutraceuticals. And uh, I would request, you know, nowadays, you know, people have realized health is wealth, not vice versa, after the COVID. And people are now largely dependent on the pre preventive approach, you know. How do we prevent? So a lot of wellness centers have, uh, have come up because government is also working towards a preventive policy then treatment. So this is how, you know, the whole world is looking at it and it's a very important area. And I really uh, sort of congratulate all these speakers and I would sort of ask for this suggestion so we uh, note it down, down and then I think uh, Professor, he, we have to sort of pass it on to our ministry for further action. So I would request Uh, thank you, ma'am, and thank you, all of you. So uh, what we think, I mean, as an institute, as in uh, part of a, a conglomerate that, that focuses on wellness uh, and natural medicines, we have been thinking on the same line, that can we get uh, our drugs uh, across the borders and try to get the acceptability uh, across the world. And one way, as we have seen from a fantastic presentation, that there are potentials. Unfortunately, India has not, hasn't really tapped on those. Out of 900 odd applications, uh, there was none from India. And we are hoping that we would be able to uh, break uh, that uh, jinx. Patanjali has been working on the same line. We are trying to get all the relevant data for at least six to seven single herb phytopharmaceuticals. And are targeted that we will uh, file that up uh, by 2023. The major challenges we have felt was, uh, okay, so there is an, again, uh, agreement and disagreement from the regulatory perspective. So the type of experiment and the assays that have been uh, described in those guidelines, some of them we believe are actually uh, not necessary. They are rudimentary. They have been just uh, taken up uh, maybe as a more precaution, and they are more relevant for the NC kind of compound than the natural compound. But hopefully, uh, the regulatory um, landscape would improve as we move along. We are moving in the right direction, so changes would happen. And we hope that uh, we will have a few new uh, drugs coming from this phase very quickly. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, you're right. I think, I think uh, we are all hoping it. But then, you know, the regulatory part is really important. And then uh, one of our colleagues, Professor Sandeep, was driving this regulation because, you know, the people, uh, are the main is the trust of the people in this uh, system of phytopharmaceutical and nutraceutical. So regulation is really plays an important role and what Dr. Sandeep said is very important and we should really be, you know, whenever they, we are working on this, I've seen, you know, we, so most of the time we fail in this area and then getting those approvals <coughs> becomes a very difficult so, job. So I would request Dr. Regarding this phytopharmaceuticals, I think uh, there are three points I want to discuss here. Like, we should clearly create a borderline between the nutraceuticals and phytopharmaceuticals, even this Ayush and phytopharmaceuticals. Many times people call Ayush products as phytopharmaceuticals. So there, uh, even these guidelines are specially created to create the borderline. Ayush products, they do not need any standardization of four markers. That is an extract, Ayush products. This is an enriched fraction. We cannot develop extract as a phytopharmaceutical. So there is a clear borderline, but people do not understand this. So this guy, uh, borderline is very, very important. Even you develop any Irish product, phytopharmaceutical, you can always market that as a nutraceutical. Nobody can stop that. You can do, do both the things parallelly. So that is another great opportunity. Even this, I, I feel that based upon my experience, US FDA and India guidelines, if you compare, US FDA guidelines are much, much relax, uh, uh, easier to follow. You can uh, submit your IND application to the USFD very easily with less amount of data. So that kind of guidelines, we, we, should, we should match those guidelines. So uh, some of the examples like, if there is a traditional knowledge is there, you don't need any safety pharmacology. Most of the public institutions, they don't have funding for GLP talks. A lot of funding is required. Even mice and rat you can do in-house. You have to do the non-rodent. Non-rodent means dogs or monkeys. Once regulatory study you have to do one crore you have to spend because we are struggling since the last two, in, two years. We submitted one IND application to the DCGI 2020, April 2020. Two, after two months, they give us uh, partial approval that 
you do regular toxicology in rodent. We did not do rodent, no, non-rodent. So, because funding was not there. And we tried to convince them because this plant is virginous data is documented in Ayurveda, a lot of traditional knowledge is there. So, if there, that kind of knowledge is there, we already did the preclinical toxicology in rats and mice. So, that kind of relation should be given so that we can do phase one clinical trial. So, that kind of relation is not there. So, we, can, we should learn from the USFDA. For an example, I have shown this proton lechery. This company has not done any animal pharmacology, any animal toxicology. Directly, they are going to the clinical trial. So, that is the reason it has got the FDA approval in 2012 itself. So we should, we, we, should learn, we should learn from that. Another is EMA, European Agency. They created the three categories. One is traditional knowledge based, one is well-established use, third is standalone. Only in case of standalone, you need a full data. So again, India should also create standard three categories. Then we can move far, uh, fast forward. Because in public institution, we can do animal validation. Beyond that, we publish and we forget it, which ship to another plant. So that is our problem. So to get a funding and this kind of relation is there, you can leave. This chemist will get motivated and we can develop more and more products. Yeah, I think that uh, Yeah, I do agree with uh, both uh, everyone here, but I would like to add few more things. It is like for for me, if uh, if we are going for a single and a single uh, chemical out of an extract, how is it different from the NCE development? The only extent, only difference it will cause is um, maybe we have less amount of uh, mine, less mine to dig into. Uh, but uh, un unfortunately, we have to do the same things what we are doing for the NCs. In my view, uh, means development of extracts as a whole, or in general, understanding the traditional knowledge. What because what we have, we are eating. Means in 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 the case because there are so many things what we are regularly eating through ages, and they are very different from and so we need not to do many studies at the safety level for example in one of the studies what we did we found out that capsaicin cinnamon menthol can act as anti obesity agent and it is quite surprising that all our homes we make chutney every day what do it has all these things only so uh, there is a tr there is a wisdom traditional wisdom and people are eating it since ages our forefathers are eating so there is some sense so if we can take that in that knowledge give it ed evidence and try to develop then we may not need even the safety pharmacologies and all those things directly we can as a functional food nutraceutical we can put it in the market i i hope you will agree on that Yeah, I think uh, very well suggestions by all the three experts. I think uh, ma'am has already said that we can definitely make one small draft out of it. How to take forward this phytopharmaceutical as well as nutraceutical product. And apart from that, I would like to ask also Sandeep as he developed phytopharmaceutical and licensed initially as nutraceutical. Very good thing because that is easier to do than the stringent regulation of phytopharmaceutical. But uh, the correlation of the biomarker with the activity of the fraction, how is it correlated, that is a challenge. And I think we need a brainstorm on this phytopharmaceutical drug regulation, as you rightly pointed out, how to relax the regulation. Because what I feel as we are working seeing in the lab for the students, it is never easy uh, to, let us say, validate and uh, reproduce the process that we have developed for a particular, uh, you can say, enriched fraction. That is the main requirement in phytopharmaceutical requirement. So how, what about your opinion on that? Like in case of uh, roitokin, is it correlating four compounds, one or two with the activity of the extract, uh, I mean fraction? Yes, it's exactly the same thing we did. We first work on the pure natural product. We isolated the pure natural product. We tested in vitro, in vivo, and the dose, whatever you get, the, for example, Rohitkin, we tested in the uh, CIA model, collagen and arthritis. At 5 mg per kg, it is showing the efficacy. TNF alpha levels reduction, even IgG1 antibody levels, that is getting reduced. In the same model, we tested enriched fraction. So how much that enriched fraction contain? My enriched fraction contain 5% of the Rohitkin. So equivalent dose, we calculated the uh, this enriched fraction, and uh, enriched fraction also contains same amount of Rohitkin. So same level of activity. I think one of the slide slide was not here in the presentation, but we okay. did that. So always right. we have to correlate the efficacy with the pure marker. All right. 
Yeah, I think that is very important uh, input because when we go for phytopharmaceutical product, it is the toughest part actually to correlate the activity with the markers as mentioned in the definition of the, uh, you can say, phytopharmaceutical drug. And uh, with respect to, let us say, Ayush, as he mentioned, now Ayush has also started using the term Ayush Suticals. So uh, it's really a confusion between these three, phyto, neutra, and Ayush Sutikal. They are also using the same plants as we are using in, uh, uh, let us say, the uh, phytopharmaceutical, let us say. But the same medicinal plants, we take the clue from our traditional medicine, from all Ayush systems of medicine. And one more thing I would like to also mention, because this is all fine, we are talking about uh, pure compound-based, NC-based drug discovery and all that, but, and we do prepare the fractions. But what we miss down the line, do you know the way it is used in Ayurveda? That we are lacking, that we are not thinking. That something is, uh, let us say, made in the aqueous only. Why we need to make a non-aqueous or organic fraction? In that case, the way it is prepared, the way it is described in our uh, ancient system of medicine, like it has to be prepared in particular dosage form, it is uh, the aqueous based, then we should see that process and try to replicate in the lab and then use it. That part is, I think, missing when we go for all these phytochemical investigations from plants. So, Ayush so, generally allows only aqueous and hydroalcoholic. Yeah. But in phytopharmaceutical, there is no any uh, regulation like exactly. this. You can any, do use any solid, you can dichloromethane, hexane, anything you can use. Because ultimately, you have to do the safety pharmacology. If any residual solvent is there, that will get captured in the toxicity. So, anything is allowed in phytopharmaceutical. Another is that if your single marker is showing the activity, why to develop as a part of hospital? That question is obvious. Like if your pure compound is showing, why to go in a complex mixture you want to make a drug? But many examples are there. Crude extracts are showing activity. If you isolate 10 compounds, individually test compounds, they are not showing equal level of activity. Because synergistic effect is already is there. there. Yeah. That is the reason in many diseases, like there are rheumatoid arthritis, autoimmune diseases, some of the chronic diseases, the option is only for these botanical drugs. That is the option as an add-on therapy. That is the reason this is very important field. Exactly, and we need to actually understand this synergism yes. and try to study scientifically, which is missing uh, in our system of medicine, I think. And one more gray area I would like to address as we are associated with uh, ethnopharmacology, that you know the traditional healers, they are there in every pocket of the country and we are all missing that link because they have interesting formulas. So if they are actually somehow registered and study scientifically, that is another great wealth which is lying unexplored in India because every pocket of India, every part of India has these uh, traditional healers. I think that, that is another part I think we need to also take into consideration when we go for this product development from uh, medicinal plants. So another point I will do just very important point here I think that I missed. So while working on this botanical drugs or phytopharmaceutical, you have to get the approval from National Biodiversity Board. That is a very right. huge challenging task. When we apply for this board, it takes almost two years also, we do not get the approval. That's you true. have to call That's them, true. you have to personally visit, then only you will get the approval. Yes. And without getting approval, you cannot file the IP and you, can develop, you cannot develop the product also. This is a big challenge. And that is the reason challenge. pharmaceutical companies are not working in this area. I think all of us are facing that. Yes, yes. If you go for plant something like Giloy and all, yeah. then it becomes easier. So we try to do the same thing for Giloy Ashwagandha. Yeah. It is easier to get those kind of approval. But like something like Kesar, of course, that's very rare. And they think that if you go to tap it for getting drugs, then you will take out all of it. Then diversity might be compromised. So maybe that is the reason. Maybe for industry, it is easier to get. Academic people, they cannot follow us also. That is the problem. We believe other way around. Yeah. We think academics can do it faster than no, industry. Okay. But one thing that we talked about, traditional he uh, healers, I think there's one area as well, the tribal healers, which are the one which are sitting in, in like a very deep pockets and their way of treating things are actually very different. So we started doing the same thing too. So we have uh, one thing going on with uh, um, tribal healers and we found their formulations, and their knowledge is actually very unique. They use those plants for some other specific diseases that, that has been described in Ayurveda. So that's a very good point, sir, actually, indeed. Thank you.
people who have actually chronic diseases and times they are being asked to take the Ayurvedic diseases medications. So can't we uh, actually go ahead for interaction studies more so that we get the evidence base that this medication, if it is interacting, how much extent, you know, we are interacting with those medications and if it has a bad effect, so we need to reduce it or we need to sometimes, uh, you know, finish that dosage. But uh, that is, I think that's a, that's a field where I, from long time I was thinking that if we can have those interaction effects between the allopathic and the Ayurvedic medications. So I fully agree with you because uh, the critical diseases like uh, organ transplantation and uh, other uh, autoimmune disorder where patient is on the chronic situation, if they started taking the Ayurvedic or phytopharmaceuticals, you never know because if the organ transplant patient is taking tacrolimus and uh, with therapeutic drug, it is under the therapeutic drug monitoring, and uh, if the drug is level, the kidney will get rejected. So I think uh, prior to start, such type of drug interaction studies for the, some critical drugs is must. I think I, I will not sort of no, really agree with all of you because, you know, nowadays India has a lot of traditional knowledge. Only thing is we need to do some reverse engineering to understand the scientific basis. And we have seen, you know, when we, have, or we don't get treated by allopathy, we, we revert back to these medicines, the ordinary system. Where, and, you know, the, the time now is to understand the scientific base, basis of it validating them scientifically and maybe adding more value to, to the existing preparation and using them. Because uh, this is how, you know, all these Ayush, Ayurveda, Siddha, Yunani, Yoga, Homeopathy, all have scientific basis. Only thing we need to explore it, understand it, and that can be more, more of a, you know, that in that direction maybe, you know, we can strengthen our healthcare system and it can uh, take more of a, you know, in a pre it can go into preventive mode, even wellness, like yoga, you know, it is promotive and preventive. So all this I think we need to adopt and then scientifically we need to convince people, we need to get convinced and this is a good area which uh, we, sh we should be pursuing and I am happy that you have a department of traditional medicine. Really, yeah, you know? So the Mohali has, and I have been thinking, I, I think I talked to you also through, you know, have something like this. Maybe we should really uh, scale up and the, uh, also scale up the scope of this department, even another 9%. Because it between CSR and micro yeah. should be in this area. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, thank you so much. It was great interacting with all of you. You are great audience also, and I want to, huh? any question? Any young uh, people who are sitting at the back? I think you are you are going to take this forward. So any any question? Are women empowerment as kitne sari women bethi hain? Ek to puch lo. Ha, beta puch ha. Hello, sir. I would like to know that uh, you are working on Vidanya, but what kind of formulation uh, you are uh, thinking of preparing from that? Yes, sir. And, sir, all of them are. Uh, is there any novel novelty in those formulations? So, sir, uh, have you patented that uh, technique or process? <laughs> okay, sir.
थैंक यू सो मच सर a very nice discussion i uh, based on the discussion uh, there is one point uh, where we have said that if there is some rare plant and we want to explore that uh, so it is uh, very difficult from environmental point of view we can't exploit that so there is one thing like people are going for alternative sources like there is a term like endophytic fungi so from uh, like earlier from taxes uh, this uh, packly taxol was there and now from the endophytic fungi same uh, chemical has been so uh, i want to know your expert opinion like how feasible it is to go for alternative sources like yes this can be one of the parallel paths where we can go for uh, the active ingredients through this alternative sources without uh, you know hampering the environment much so on that point if you could चैलेंजेस विच वी आर फेसिंग इफ वी आर ट्राइंग फॉर अ single molecule uh, active molecule uh, from natural product drug discovery point of view so i think this area should be uh, more explored sure. and given more importance in parallel direction along with yeah i think uh, endophytic fungi definitely is a yes. very attractive source but the issue is actually again uh, to identify them and culture them yes. is uh, not easy and their association with the plants you yes. are talking about uh, the yes. depends upon what is your objective if you want you are looking for a particular natural product like you want to produce uh, get a alternative source for that natural product yes. endophytic fungi is a good option yes. even you can do the manipulations there you can generate um, other natural products also yes. which are not much naturally occurring in the plant so that option is there tissue culture and those things yes. but in this part of pharmaceutical area that option is not there because fungi is not allowed under this okay. definition yes. so best alternative is that do captive cultivation for rt plants So that is the only option. Uh, okay. Even if you do captive cultivation, even biodiversity board also they will not say anything. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. In our uh, Mohali in Naipur, we are also integrating the information technology with the traditional medicine. Yes. We have today only one poster was presented where Ayurvedic uh, formulation. and the corresponding information corresponding database and later on going to molecular docking and molecular dynamics a continuum of uh, integration of information technology with traditional medicine uh, has been uh, established we still did not publish our work but we are hoping to get our results quickly soon yeah yeah that is right. yes i think uh, his group my group and we have dhanvantari ayurvedic medical college trying to do this uh, venture let's see how how far we reach yeah so good another uh, ai now has come into picture artificial intelligence with uh, the traditional medicine yeah so i think thank you uh, so the message the, the last message is i god was use technology to explore traditional medicine use technology to explore phytopharmaceutical use technology to explore nutraceuticals and many other suticals which may be on the way <laughs> so thank you so much it was nice i want to thank my colleague dr jakkar 
Jachak and other excellent speaker and audience who really made the show alive by asking questions and keeping us alert and vigilant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Also, I request Dr. Anurag to felicitate our co-chairperson of the session, Professor S.M. Jatak, by giving memento. <laughs> <laughs>